the Community Church of Boston's yearly speakers program would not be complete uh, without the presence of Dr. Howard Zinn on a given Sunday. He is a good friend of this church, and his incisive wisdom and wit are always greatly anticipated and appreciated, along with being professor of political science at Boston University and author of A People's History of the United States and other books, his play called Emma will be opening off-Broadway sometime in the near future at the Perry Street Theater. I'm delighted to present to you Howard Zinn, whose address is called The Legacy of Karl Marx. Well, uh, for those of you who are here for the first time, you might already get the idea that this is not a very ordinary church. Uh, I was startled the first time I ever came to the community church. I had a certain picture in my mind of what a church was like. And if I, come to a church and I hear talk about what's going on in Central America, a report from Germany, and I guess most startling of all, a talk on the legacy of Karl Marx. <laughs> I try, try to think of how many churches in America are just going to just calmly and blithely have a talk on Karl Marx. Uh, so, uh, Bill Alberts has uh, been a very special person here in Boston. He, you can always count on him. Something is going on. He's always there. Always gives support to people who need support and the movements that need support. So I'm happy to come here to be sandwiched in between the offerings. <laughs> So, uh, I guess the, re the reason for, for talking about Marx is, uh, the special reason for talking about Marx is that it was a hundred years ago this month that, that Karl Marx died. Uh, and since so many people take his name in vain, there's people that do several things with Marx. They either attack him, uh, point out how wrong he was, how foolish he was, uh, how he's been repudiated and refuted again and again. Of course, you begin, you begin to get suspicious when a person has to be refuted about a million times and he's still there, you see. So, but he, people either re repudiate him and refute him and attack him and denounce him, or they adopt him totally, and they present themselves as uh, spokespeople for him. And they say, they tell you, they tell you exactly what he meant, and they want you to make sure you memorize it. Uh, so you have to be very careful listening to me uh, that I don't do that. Uh, but all of us, you know, who have been associated with Marx, who knew him, <laughs> you know, we always hope that people will get their dates confused and they'll think, we actually knew Marx. We try to talk about him intimately. Uh, his family, his, yes, I remember being there on Dean Street. Uh, let me uh, read to you uh, a few recollections of Marx by people who really did know him. Uh, just to give you an idea of 
the different things that people thought about him. Uh, when he died in March of 1883, there was a, an article in Die Neue Zeit uh, by a man named Anenkoff who wrote, Marx himself was the type of man who was made up of energy, will, and unshakable conviction. He was most remarkable in his appearance. He had a shock of deep black hair and hairy hands, and his coat was buttoned wrong. But he looked like a man with a right and power to demand respect. He always spoke in imperative words that would brook no contradiction. Here is Karl Schurz, who is a German immigrant to the United States who became a senator in the United States, and he said, Marx's utterances were indeed full of meaning, logical and clear, but I've never seen a man whose bearing was so provoking and intolerable. <laughs> Karl Liebknecht, a, a German socialist communist uh, who, some of you know, was killed in the revolutionary struggle that took place after World War I in Germany, killed by the police. He always spoke his mind completely and without any reserve. Marx was never a hypocrite. He was always incapable of it. And here's Bakunin, who had ferocious arguments with Marx. Well, there was no such thing as a mild argument with Marx. Every argument with Marx was a ferocious argument. If you weren't ferocious, he was. <laughs> Bakunin was the, the anarchist and Marx, right? But they were both members of the International Working Men's Association. Uh, and, and they battled in, the, in those meetings. Bakunin says, We saw each other fairly often, and I very much admired him for his knowledge and for his passionate and earnest devotion to the cause of the proletariat. But there was never real intimacy between us. Our temperaments did not harmonize. He called me a sentimental idealist, and he was right. I called him vain, treacherous, and morose, and I was right. <laughs> And here is Marx's daughter, Eleanor Marx. Uh, you have to listen to his daughter, right? Daughters know. Uh, the cheeriest, gayest soul that ever breathed. A man brimming over with humor, whose hearty laugh was infectious and irresistible. The kindliest, gentlest, most sympathetic of companions. If his sarcastic humor could bite like a corrosive acid, that same humor could be as balm to those in trouble and afflicted. So now you know exactly what Marx was like. <laughs> uh, but I guess I, I read those to you to indicate that Marx is a very complicated man. Uh, and a, a human being. You know, he's very, not si recollected by most as a human being. He's a theoretician. He's a writer of these, these very complicated books and his philosophy and political economy and all of that. But, but he was a, a remarkable human being. Uh, and yes, not easy to get along with. Everybody says that. Even his daughter, <laughs> when she wasn't... Uh, expressing her love for him, not easy to get along with. Uh, but at the same time, a uh, passionate man who cared about people and what was happening to people in the world. And I, I guess I, I tell you about this because it seems to me that the, the legacy of a person who is a thinker is not just the legacy of the person as a thinker, but the legacy of the person as a human being. Uh, and that's important. Very important. Because however wonderful the person's ideas are, the person as a human being has to try to embody those ideas. Now to embody marvelous ideas even, to embody them perfectly in a world like this is very, very difficult. And without excusing Marx for his intolerance of others and sometimes his 
biting tongue and uh, some of the characteristics that made uh, you know, Bakunin talk the way he did, without excusing him for those characteristics, it must be remembered that Marx uh, lived, worked uh, in a situations that were, they were not simply easy. He was not just a, an intellectual writing in the library in uh, comfort, not just that. Uh, it's true, Marx was born to a comfortable German family in the Rhineland, and he got an education. They could send him to school, and he could get a PhD, uh, and all of, yes, th there was that background and that life, and he, he married a, a woman who also came from a family of wealth and uh, German nobility and all of that. But uh, when they got married and they, and they uh, left Germany, I suppose maybe it's more proper to say we're forced to leave Germany. Uh, they lived in hardship uh, and they knew what it was like to be shunted from country to country. They knew what it was like to be in exile again and again, to be driven out of where you live, driven first out of Cologne where Marx was uh, writing uh, articles for the Rheinische Zeitung, the uh, articles that annoyed the authorities because he would defend the right of, of poor peasants to collect firewood on the estates of the uh, rich, uh, trespassing, uh, taking firewood which is not theirs because they were coal. And he, he defended their rights. Uh, and he wrote other articles like that. He, he became a nuisance to the authorities, and so they uh, had him leave Cologne. Then he went to Paris, where, where exiles usually ended up. Uh, they still do, I guess. Sitting in the cafes in Paris. And there he met, oh, Heinrich Heine and Proudhon. Uh, there he met Engels again. And, uh, and then f after becoming a nuisance to the Paris police, he was expelled uh, from Paris, went to Brussels, where he and, he and Engels wrote a number of things together and, and they, where their friendship became very close. And then uh, he became distasteful to the Belgian authorities. And so he was expelled from Brussels. And then he went back to Cologne. And then he got into trouble in Cologne again and was put up on trial for trying to overthrow the state. Well, I guess he was in a way. <laughs> uh, not immediately. I mean, it wasn't something he had planned for the next morning or something, but he was the kind of person who gave all authorities the impression he was about to overthrow their governments very soon. And so they, they, got, they got him out of Cologne again, and this time he, he went to London uh, in 1849 and then lived the rest of his years in, in London, uh, where he, he wrote his great works on political economy. Uh, but where also he, he lived in the real world in London, that is the real world of poverty. Uh, his, uh, they ate meat and very, very rarely. Bread and potatoes was their diet, and they couldn't pay the rent. And when their kids were, were born, they uh, couldn't pay doctor's bills. And, uh, Five children were born to uh, Jenny and Karl Marx, and three of them died, two of them within a year after they were born. Uh, they, they, knew, they knew something of the life of working people living in poor districts whose kids died at early ages and where there wasn't enough food in the house and there wasn't money to pay the bills and where they had to borrow money to buy the coffin to bury their little son in. And I tell you this to indicate that you know, Marx cannot simply be dismissed as a bourgeois intellectual writing from you know, the lofty towers of the British Museum about poverty. And Yes, he was in the real world in that way.
He was also in the real world in another way, and that is he was involved in the political struggles that went on in Europe and all over the world. Uh, he was a, an intellectual and a theoretician, and he buried himself for nine hours a day in the British Museum, and at the same time, he was alive and sensitive to the things that were going on. When friends of his were being put up on trial in Germany, uh, he stopped what he was doing in the British Museum and, and wrote and fought and gathered evidence to help them in their political trials. Uh, the revolutions of 1848 that took place in Europe, Marx, uh, was involved in writing and, and uh, one of the things that led to his expulsion from Europe. Uh, when revolutions take place, the, the authorities always look for who started it. You know, so somebody must have started it. I mean, it can't be that these people just rose up because they were dissatisfied with conditions. Somebody did it. So they find somebody, you know, they get rid of him then they were always surprised when a revolution takes place again 15 years later or 20 years later. But Marx was active, involved, writing. He was a journalist, too. He's not just a theoretician. He wrote, during the 1860s, he was a, the European correspondent for the New York Tribune, and he wrote articles about world affairs for the New York Tribune, hundreds of articles. Uh, he kept up with the Paris commune of 1871 and wrote about it. A lot of the things that come down to us now as historical works were things that Marx wrote in the heat of the moment about things that were happening uh, at that time. So I, I, I tell you this to, to make the point that uh, Marx was not just an intellectual. He lived in the real world and experienced the real world and had an impact on it and the most important thing about him is not that he developed this theory or that theory. The most important thing about him was that he saw theory only as important to the extent that it furthered revolution, that it furthered struggle, that it would change the conditions of people. That's what differentiated him from Hegel, who was his great philosophical mentor, because Hegel thought, well, <clears throat> People will free themselves when they understand things. In other words, when they get smarter. <laughs> get smart and you will be free. Marx didn't think that was enough. Marx didn't think it was enough to understand how things were in order to be free. He thought in order to be free, you have to not just understand conditions, you have to change conditions. You have to overturn conditions. You have to create new conditions. Uh, that's what made Marx a, a revolutionary and Hegel merely a philosopher. Remember that famous statement of Marx in his thesis on Feuerbach, you know, the point of philosophers up to now has been to interpret the world, but uh, really the thing to do is to change the world. So this is Marx, the revolutionist, the activist, uh, the person in the real world. Uh, that's a legacy that very often is forgotten when people go over his ideas. Because uh, his ideas were enormously important. He had things to say uh, which are still pertinent today. Oh, I know not everything that Marx said was right, and, I, and, and, uh, and not every analysis that Marx made of the world has worked its way out in exactly the way that some people might expect from reading his work. But some of his most fundamental insights into human society remain pertinent and profound today. His, his ideas about alienation, about work. And he wrote this when he was 25 years old, just on the basis of looking around him at 19th century Europe, at, industrial, at people working in 19th century Europe. And what he saw was that people were working on jobs that were alien to them and producing things that were taken away from them uh, and working in situations that estranged them from their brothers and sisters and their neighbors that isolated them, even while it sort of technically and physically brought them together in factories and in cities, it isolated them spiritually and psychologically and emotionally from the people they worked with. 
He saw, he saw what work of this sort, work in exploitative conditions, work under modern industrial conditions, work where people worked for somebody else and not for themselves or for some group. He saw what this did to people, how this corroded their human spirit, how this made them less than human. And he wrote about this at the age of 25 in these manuscripts that he uh, put aside in Paris and that weren't then published until the 1930s. Uh, if you read Studs Terkel's book, Working, uh, just interviews with people who work all over America, different jobs, you will see that the things that people say correspond to the things that Marx wrote about when he wrote about alienated labor. Most people under modern conditions of society work at jobs that are alien to them and produce things that are alien to them, things that then dominate them. Uh, Marx talked about commodity fetishism, which is a, a, a fancy term, but which uh, Emerson expressed in his own way in, uh, well, roughly around the same time in the United States when Emerson talked about how uh, human beings were losing touch with, with, with the world in a, in a direct way, that the industrial world was piling itself up over people. Or as Emerson put it, things are in the saddle. Things are in the saddle and ride mankind. The things are becoming more important than people. That all the, the, the emphasis on technology and progress and advance has created a world in which human beings become less important and things become more important. Things on Earth, or maybe things in space. I was just thinking about that. That's what's important, those things in space. Uh, Marx talked about commodity fetishism. He's talking about things that people produce and that then become more important than people themselves. He wasn't even thinking so much of something even worse, and that is when things that are produced are not even used in any way except for destruction. That is, commodity fetishism comes to its most atrocious point when the commodities become nuclear weapons and ride mankind and threaten mankind. Uh, Marx saw that process very early. And for people to understand that and see that today is, is very, very important in trying somehow to bring about the sovereignty of human beings on this earth against all the things that are being piled up to dominate us. Marx understood that the, the, the political configurations of the world, the uh, states that are set up, the governments that are set up, are uh, set up as uh, oppressive mechanisms. They're not neutral. They're not benign. They're not set up by all of us. They're set, these governmental mechanisms are set up by the people who control the economic resources of society by small elites that dominate the economy and then uh, create something uh, which they present to us as, uh, well, you voted for him. Him? Who? I never saw him. <laughs> Where did he come from? Uh, the state. Uh, Marx understood about religion. It's interesting, and I said before that the, uh, you won't find too many churches having too many Sunday sermons on the legacy of Marx. And uh, I think, you know, Marx, you know, the, the godless communism, atheist, and all of that. But, and, and then Marx is always quoted as saying, you know, religion is the opium of the people, right? And, Opium, as we know, is illegal. And 
bad. And, but Marx saw something else about this. Uh, he did not just say that religion is the opium of people. He did not say it in that uh, way that uh, uh, an agent for the uh, uh, Narcotics Bureau would say it. Uh, he, he said it in a kindly way. He said it in an understanding way. He said, religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature the heart of a heartless world, the soul of soulless conditions, the opium of the people. That's a little different. Uh, and he understood that people would need this spirit, this sigh, this soul. Uh, people would need this uh, to tide them over. <laughs> and would need it so long as conditions required them to look for soul in a soulless world. But he hoped that someday conditions would exist uh, which would not require opium or simply size uh, or simply the superficiality of a temporary bomb holding, holding back uh, the world for an hour on Sunday or uh, a moment of your life. Marx had a certain vision of, of what a future society would be like. He didn't spell it out in detail, and, and so we're very often impatient with him because we wanted, you know, we want to know how should things be like in a new and better society. And Marx didn't really tell us in, in any detail. He told us enough, however, told us enough to suggest that systems that have come into being in this century and call themselves socialist systems the first one being the Soviet Union in 1917, do not represent the kind of society that Marx seemed to foresee as the answer, as the solution, as the, the proper socialist communist society. Uh, that seems, at least to me, fairly clear. Marx wrote in, in one of his early books, that he wrote with Engels, the Holy Family, that talked about freedom and a freedom as not being just something negative, able, enabling us to avoid this or that, but that we must be positively free to express our true individuality. Uh, that doesn't describe the Soviet Union today. I mention this because you know, I talked about people who attack Marx and I talked about people who take over Marx and the Soviet Union has tried to take over Marx, incorporate him. He, you know, he's there everywhere. Everything is, you know, Marx, the hero, and so on. Uh, but what they, what they have there doesn't represent what Marx seemed to be talking about. Also in the Holy Family, he talked about punishment and crime and doing away with punishment. Instead, he said, we must destroy the social conditions which engender crime and give to each individual the scope which he needs in society in order to develop his life. In 1853, Marx wrote a letter to the New York Tribune in which he spoke out against capital punishment. He said he could not understand how capital punishment could be justified in any society glorying in its civilization. Uh, you would think that any society that sets itself up as socialist would listen to the words of Marx today. Or in the Communist Manifesto, in place of the old bourgeois society with its classes and class antagonisms, we shall have an association in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. And then he talked about how 
the economy should work and how things should be distributed and how uh, what he hoped for, and he said this in 1875 when he was criticizing a program set up by the German the Democratic Party, he, he hoped that uh, at some point, uh, oh, maybe not immediately, but it, that was, that's the direction in which people should go, that uh, from each according to his ability to each according to his need, that's how things should be distributed. Uh, and any society that calls itself socialist that continues to distribute and doesn't move in a direction of distributing things according to need is somehow violating that precept, it seems to me, of Marx. And Marx's closest friend, Engels, said what Marx himself certainly would have echoed. Engels said this uh, after Marx's, shortly after Marx's death when he wrote his book on the origin of the family. He talked about how the state should be put as soon as possible into the Museum of Antiquities by the side of the spinning wheel and the bronze axe. In another point, Engels talked about how the very, the worst parts of the state which means the police, the courts, the jails, should be lopped off at the earliest possible moment. And I say this to you because, you know, I, I have in my files things which are painful to have in one's files. I said painful uh, because here, here's a country calling itself socialist and, and talking again and again and again uh, about Marx and teaching, presumably, Mar have all, all these textbooks on Marxism and Marxism-Leninism. Mother of jailed Soviet dissident says he's being denied visitors. The mother of the convicted Soviet dissident, Anatoly B. Sharansky, said today she had received a letter from her son informing her he had been denied, denied all visitation rights for 1981. Ida Milgram said she had to cancel a visit to his labor camp on April 27th, a meeting that she and her longest, younger son had awaited for a year. Here's another. Moscow silencing psychiatry clinics. Psychiatry clinics. I'm sorry. <laughs> critics. <laughs> silencing psychiatry critics. Not silencing the clinics. <laughs> Expanding the clinics. Silencing the critics. I'll try to get this straight, because they are trying to get it straight. Um, the conviction this week of Felix Serebrov, a key figure in efforts to document Soviet use of psychiatric hospitals to punish political offenders. The authorities here have completed a series of prosecutions aimed at silencing domestic criticism of a practice that Moscow seems particularly keen to conceal. The trial stemmed from the activities of a group calling itself the Working Committee to investigate the uses of psychiatry for political purposes. The commission was established in 1977 to monitor the Helsinki Accords, which the Soviet Union signed on human rights. And then both the group came under pressure from the authorities, house searches, arrests, trials, people sent to labor camps, uh, terms from three to 12 years. And interestingly enough, at the end of this article, it points out that there was a conference of Soviet neuropathologists in Moscow, and the chief neuropsychiatrist at the Ministry of Health, Dr. Zoya Serbliakova, said that 1.2% of the patients at a Moscow psychiatric hospital were admitted in the course of the year in connection with slanderous statements and groundless complaints to officials. When uh, I don't, I don't want to go on and on because uh, you know there's always a problem in this in this world of terrible states. If you go on and on about the Soviet Union, right? People think, ah, you're secretly an admirer of the American state. <laughs> and then if you go on and on about the American state without ever mentioning the Soviet Union, people say, ah. <laughs> 
a secret admirer of the Soviet Union. Why don't you go back to where you came from? <laughs> People say this without knowing where you came from, usually. So they, they don't even know where they're sending you. Uh, but uh, on the psychiatric business, uh, Muffin Traber, whom you know as Marsha Traber, because that's the way she's listed on the program, uh, but who is known to her intimates as Muffin Traber, uh, and whom uh, I encountered in a surprise, didn't know the community church had its agents all over the world, <laughs> there, encountered there in, in Nuremberg uh, last month. Uh, and at that, at that conference of the Greens, which both, both of us attended, uh, there was a, one interesting witness uh, among the 62 of us who were so-called witnesses at this three-day conference, very intense. Uh, one of them was an, a, an American uh, who had been an officer in the Air Force. I don't know if you, were, if you had already left Muffin when he spoke. Yeah, I think. Uh, so I may as well inform you. Just look upon this as my telling you about this with other people listening. Uh, he had been in the American Air Force. He was an officer in the Air Force. He was in charge of a nuclear installation in England. That is, he was in charge of an installation that had nuclear weapons aimed at the Soviet Union. And uh, this was in the early 1960s when he first began working there. Then came the Vietnam War, and the Vietnam War made him begin to question what the United States was doing, not only in Vietnam, but elsewhere in the world. Made him think about American foreign policy. Made him look around at his own nuclear installation. For instance, in order to fire the nuclear weapons, Two keys had to be turned simultaneously. The two keys were 10 feet apart. Very clever. So that no one maniac could fire the nuclear weapons. Only two maniacs <laughs> could fire the nuclear weapons. Well, he noted a number of other things, you know. He, he noted the number of computer failures there were, right? 147 computer failures in a year and a half. You know, those computers that say whether the rockets are coming from the Russians, right? Not important, just a computer, right? It's like a word processor, uh, except that it involves the death of the planet. But, you know, oh, blips appear on the screen, Oh, the Russians are coming. Oh, it turns out to be a flock of wild geese. Well, a harmless mistake, except that a number of times it sent the whole American nuclear force into an alert. Bombers, B-52 sent into the air, armed with H-bombs, sent on their way to the Soviet Union, and before they were, oh, they discovered the mistake and called them back. How nice. Uh, the, the, the people who built the computers defended the computers, saying, really, these computers work almost all the time. They said, they only, they, we only have trouble with them in times of emergency. <laughs> well, he noted these things. He noticed that the American Air Force had lost some hydrogen bombs from time to time. You know, like over the coast of Spain, uh, in, remember that, in the 1960s, lost four hydrogen bombs off the coast of Spain. Uh, just carelessness. Uh, if you were, had to do a report card on the, you know, you'd sort of give them C. <laughs> carelessness. Uh, he noted these things. He decided, this Air Force officer decided, after, after looking at a number of these facts, he decided, uh, he didn't want to have anything to do with this. He thought it was all crazy. 
uh, and uh, told his commanding officer he wanted to transfer, get out of there, didn't want to have anything to do with that. So what they do? They sent him in for psychiatric observation and found him to be a schizophrenic and discharged him from the service. And because he might collect a pension, since he had incurred a disability, right, a mental disability in the Army, they said he had been a schizophrenic before he came into the Army. So he couldn't collect a pension, which meant, of course, that he was a schizophrenic at the time they put him in charge of these nuclear installations. <laughs> Well, uh, I, I, the point was made at the tribunal that it seems that both the Soviet Union and the United States use psychiatric diagnoses to get rid of people who are embarrassing in one way or the other. Uh, I don't know what Marx would say if he were alive today, uh, but it seems to me he would find all of these states, the capitalist states and the so-called socialist states, as abominations. Uh, what I liked about going to Nuremberg, to this conference organized by the Green Party, it was not just the Green Party, it was people there from all over the world. Uh, people there from all countries. It was a wonderful gathering. It was an international gathering. If there is any, imp anything in Marx, which it seems to me is critically important in that legacy he leaves to us, it's the legacy of internationalism. The idea that these boundaries that separate us all over the world, that carve up the world into these places where people need passports and visas and can't get in and can't get out, with their flags and national anthems and people willing to kill one another over the difference in a flag or a national anthem or a boundary. Uh, all that has to be done away with. People have to do away with it first in their minds, have to think themselves out of those national boundaries and begin making contacts with one another, stretch out to one another all over the world, create an international society, understand that we have a, a common interest, no more national interest, none of this business of national interest, national defense. It's all a lie. There is no such thing as national interest anymore. There's only international interest. There's only the interest of all people all over the world on all sides of these boundaries, an interest that all people have in common, an interest that they have in common against those in all countries who would consign them to poverty, to death, to exploitation. Uh, that kind of internationalism is what Marx stood for, and that kind of internationalism, it seems to me, is uh, what we need to be thinking about and acting upon are very, very hard. And that's why it's good to hear reports from Germany, reports of what's going on in Central America, and to see the community church devoting itself to spreading that kind of word. It's a very good legacy. Thank you.